Hi everyone, welcome to this LSE Festival online session. How should we use AI in higher education? Part of our Skills for a Fast Changing World series hosted by LSE Online. In this series, we invite LSE experts to discuss research trends in their field about professional skills we need for success. My name is Jeff and I'm a program manager in the LSE Online team. LSE Online makes LSE's world leading teaching and research accessible to a global audience. We provide a comprehensive portfolio of online programs to equip you and your organization with the knowledge and skills to advance in an ever changing world. Today's event was part of the LSE Festival People and Change, which is taking place all week and until Saturday, the 17th of June, exploring how change affects people and how people affect change. The event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a video or podcast subject to no technical difficulties. Whilst we wait for everyone, we would love to hear where in the world you're joining us from today. Please use the chat function uh, below. For those who are joining us on Zoom, could you also please answer this short poll and let us know whether you're a student, an academic, or working for the public private sector? Today, we are welcoming Dr. Jonathan Cardoso Silva for another LSC Festival Online Skills Session. Jonathan Cardoso Silva holds a PhD in Computer Science from King's College London, specialising in the analysis of social, political, and biological networks. With a background in computer engineering, John brings a unique blend of academic and industry experience. He has worked as a software developer and led teams of data scientists at Data Science Brigade, a Brazilian data science consultancy startup. Currently, John serves as an assistant professor lecturer in the Data Science Institute, where he is also the de facto deputy director for teaching. His primary focus is on educational aspects of data science, teaching introductory level courses for social scientists. If you have any questions during the event you'd like to ask Jonathan, please post your question in the Q&A box or post them in the LinkedIn chat function. We will get as many as we can towards the end of the event. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Jonathan to begin his talk. Thank you very much for this introduction, Geoffrey. Let me share my screen so then we can get started. Um, so there we go. Okay, I get, I hope you can see my screen already. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Uh, so let me remove that out of the way. Zoom is trying to. How do I get this on? I don't think I can. I do. Okay, great. So you can see my slides, right? Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so again, Jeffrey, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and attending this session. I hope uh, you know we get you to chat a little bit towards the end of the session. And as you know, the the title is "How Should We Use AI in Higher Education?" And mostly here, I'm going to talk about my current practice. Um, especially about the last academic term, which is when people started really using it. It wasn't that much of a big thing uh, a year ago, um, even though the algorithms already existed, but it became a huge thing at the beginning of this year. So that's probably, um, that will be my focus for today. So I would like to start by uh, talking about you. So do I get to see the poll results? I know you popped up for me a little bit, but I don't know if I can see it right now. It appeared for me as well, but it did appear somewhere. I'm sure the team will be able to get you. Oh, oh here we go. go. Okay. So let's look at who you are. Uh, just so I know, uh, 
I like that the perhaps the majority of you don't quite fit in the boxes above. That's great. Um, so we have a mix of university students. We have a bit a few academics here at LSE. Great, right? So we have a a, a wide range of you know people and studying and working in different fields. So feel free to ask questions and then I can address them in the Q&A afterwards in case you know I'm talking something too specific about higher education that you don't get what I'm talking about, do let me know. Um, so a little bit about me, um, Geoffrey already done, uh, has done a great job. So I've just mentioned uh, you know, what I do here at LSE. And as I said, I teach data science courses and primarily, I teach these three courses right now during the regular academic term. Um, and I show this to you just so to, to pave uh, the way for what I'm going to talk about. So I, we have these three courses. They are all undergraduate courses. Some of you might be uh, a former student of mine. Uh, DS101 is focused on understanding the fundamentals of data science. So we learn, we teach students about the foundations, theoretical concepts. We don't go too crazy on code there. We introduce some code, but not so much. But on the other two courses, we are heavier on code. We do Python, we do R, and DS-105 specifically is about collecting and handling data and dealing with the struggles that comes with that. And there are many. DS-202 is more about the fundamental algorithms in machine learning. And it's not AI crazy. It's really like the basics of, of this world. Right, so this is what I teach, and I also have a summer school that is also about data engineering, collecting data, so you can see that all of them kind of goes into this world of the computer science corner of data science. Um, as I said, I mentioned all of this because I want you to understand what I'm going to talk about today, and these courses, they have two things in common, and which I'd like to draw your attention to. So most of the these courses, they involve writing lots of code, either R or Python. And some of them, we even let students, um, you know, we allow students to choose freely which programming language they prefer. Um, and that's that's perhaps the majority of the the day-to-day you know, -day activities in this course. You're writing code, you're getting something out of it, and then you're interpreting the results of it, or you're writing a, a big data pipeline. But some of these courses uh, and some of the assignments in the courses that are more code related, they involve writing essays and involve writing things. Uh, if you have been paying attention to the discourse in higher education, you will know that as soon as ChatGPT came out and became a huge thing, especially at the beginning of this year, at the start of this year, many people started to worry about the future of essay writing. So many said that essays are dead, uh, the essay assignment cannot be used anymore, um, but I think this is misguided, I, and I have a different view of that, and I don't think this is the essays are dead. I just think that we need to think about them uh, differently, which is something that we should have already been doing anyways. Uh, but first, let me talk about how I am using and I'm embracing generative AI and all of these tools in, uh, in our courses for code. Right? So I'm going to talk about code-related stuff first. Um, specifically about one of those courses that I showed you in the last iteration of this course, we had this final assignment. One of these assignments of this course was to look up all of these uh, data sources. So, you know, you probably are aware of Wikipedia, but maybe you don't know that there's a whole range of other data sources around the same branch of company. You have Wiki, Wikimedia, which is the foundation that manages all of this data you have data about books, quotes, species, news. There's a whole set of things. And then we let our students free to choose how they're gonna combine data. There were a set of instructions, like you have to show us that you've done this and this and that that relates to the learning objectives of the courses, but we let them free to choose what they wanted to focus on, right? And this is not a final project. It's like a real, uh, uh, a regular assignment in the course but it allows for some flexibility and creativity as part of that. That will be key to what I'm gonna talk about when it comes to generative AI, because if we want to embrace, and we, I think we should embrace generative AI in our teaching and our learning, 
creativity, originality is going to be the main thing. So we can't uh, assign students to work on things that are too formulaic or too uh, close-ended. So that's why we are going for this kind of assignment that is like very a lot more open. Um, and if you are a coder, you will know that when you're doing that and on top of writing code, you have to think creatively about what you want to get out of that. You know that there is a huge deal of trial and error, right? You have to write a piece of code first and then you get the results and then you think, uh, no, that's not what I want or that doesn't tell a good story or the data that I collected really doesn't make much sense. So then you have to go back. There's that part of it. And there's the part where you're actually um, facing the challenges of programming itself. So you're learning to program, you're learning or you're um, you know, expanding your horizons in, in, in programming. And then you face, you'll be faced with different packages different challenges in specifics of, of the syntactics of a particular, uh, the semantics or syntax, syntax of a particular programming language. So trial and error is a key part of the learning process for all of this, whether the creativity, whether it is for learning how to code. Um, and as a core thing is in, in these courses and in, in the things we teach is that students and instructors alike, we all need to be willing to embrace failure. Sometimes I'll be demonstrating a piece of code. I'll be doing a live demo to our students, and that live demo will fail. And I will not recall exactly what it is. I know which programming library. I know exactly. I know where to find information, but I don't really recall um, the right words to to type it in there. And I would argue that this is okay. This is fine. And like this is not exactly a failure. But even when it is a failure, when you type something and then you get the wrong results. You have to go back to a documentation. You have to go back to Google. That is part of the process. That's how people who write code uh, professionally, uh, as a software engineer, as a data scientist, as a data engineer, uh, this is the kind of things we're teaching here. People in this uh, career path, they do this all the time. That's all we do. So we need to embrace that trial and error. Um, and one thing that we try to teach our students and we're trying to get better with this uh, over, you know, after term and term and term is that we need to teach students how to Google stuff and to understand how to read, for example, things on Stack Overflow, uh, which is the one of the, the main websites for finding out code related uh, questions. So that was already a thing even before ChatGPT uh, existed. Um, and we wanted to have students to experience that. So it's part of the real world to get stuck with something and then you have to go and find the information. Uh, you won't just be able to fill in the blanks. Um, and as you can imagine, it, this requires a lot of contact time. So instructors and students, we would have to be in content, uh, in constant conversation to understand where the, the students like as instructor, where the students is getting uh, are getting stuck, where can we change and how can we better you know, guide them towards this process? It really takes time to learn how to do this. So, I mean, if only there was a way to automate part of this process. And that's where I think generative AI plays a big role here. So there are, uh, this, is, this is what you see here on the screen, like on the slides, like Googling and then going on Stack Overflow. It's kind of how we always did these things for the past few years uh, in this field. But now we have chatbots that we can pose certain questions and then it will kind of feel, uh, you know, it will perform the same role for us, but in a more conversational way, in an easier way to access. There's, I've seen anecdotally, I see a lot of people uh, sharing that they ask ChatGPT for code related questions a lot more than they go on Google. If you know how to write the question, if you know how to do the prompt engineering correctly, um, that will help you a lot. So, I mean, that is like paving the way for what uh, the philosophy of our courses is. And I think there's something here to learn uh, for the whole um, higher education system in general. Be more specific about what we do. Um, in the coding assignments in the last term, we let our students free to use AI help even in their coding assignments. It's not considered cheating. 
they could use ChatGPT to generate code snippets and rerun their code and then copy and paste things here and there. And I'm going to give you an example of why that is a good thing and in line with the, um, with the philosophy I just shared. But I actually encourage them to use another tool a lot more than ChatGPT. I encourage them to use GitHub Copilot, uh, which I think is better for this. And, in, and it integrates nicely with uh, tools that people would use in, uh, professionally. So let me give you an example of how it looks like to use these AI tools to write code and how that would work. Uh, and I came up with this example. I really came up with this example like at random. So I, I, I know that there's this thing in the programming language R called Leaflet, which is a package that lets you create maps like you, go, you have on Google Maps where you can zoom in, zoom out. But I knew nothing about this package. I myself didn't know anything about this package. But let's say I wanted to create this for this presentation and I wanted to create a leaflet map using R, this programming language, and center that at the LSC. How would I do that? So my normal approach would be to Google and find tutorials for leaflet. So how do I run leaflet? Uh, and then after using that, I will learn how to create a pin in the map and place it on where LSE is. And I'll have to locate LSE's latitude and longitude uh, coordinates. That, that is what I would do if I weren't using any AI tools. Let me show you how I did this using Copilot, uh, the GitHub Copilot tool. So essentially you open, this is like you're writing the code and the part in green is what I wrote. So produce a leaflet map centered at the LSE and everything you're seeing here now was generated by the AI tool. So I didn't do anything after that. So I just typed the things you see here now, the green, and I hit enter, and then GitHub Copilot will fill in the blanks for me. So it imported the right library and it created something. So if I'm blind about, like, you know, completely unaware of this package, I would just say, sure, it looks like it works. It looks like a, a, an actual code. So what would I do next? I would just simply, run this code and see what happens. So when I do that, I see that this happens. So if you zoom out, you, I mean, it worked in a way. So I get the map and I can see that it's placed, it placed a marker in London, which is great. But if you are, if you are an LSE person or if you've been to LSE, you will know that this is not where we are. Even though the marker says, you know, if you click on it, it says LSE, great, amazing. LSE is not in Tottenham Court Road. LSE is around here, uh, is in a different place. But it still is impressive that this code produced the map. It uses the right package as instructed, and it created a marker for me. It's just not exactly there. So what would I need to do here now? It's just change the coordinates, the latitude and longitude. Perfect. Now let's see how ChatGPT, the most famous perhaps, um, AI tool would do the same thing. So ChatGPT would, uh, you know, like ChatGPT likes, it's it's built as a chat, so it's very chatty. So it will write a lot of stuff and not just give you what you want. That is one of the reasons why I, I usually suggest using Copilot, because with Copilot, you'll be more productive and we stop anthropomorphizing this tool. So I, I, th I think that's a better thing to do. So with ChatGPT, you're always kind of approach it as if you're talking to a person. And that is not right, for me, like that's not the right way we should be using these tools. But anyways, it works. It produces a lot of text. It understood, I gave it kind of the same prompt that I gave to GitHub Copilot. And you can see that it says right at the, in the text, like it's centered at the London School of Economics. So there's already something interesting. It understood that LSE stands for London School of Economics. And it gave me some code, nicely formatted, and it explains what it's doing. The problem is when I run this code and I do the same thing as I did before, I get this. So I get a marker, I get a map thing that I can click. If I click on the marker, I, marker, I see that London School of Economics, great, but it still does not work um, straight away. So something here, something is missing, which for me is the most important part, the map. Uh, if you take a closer look at the code that it produced, and then I just copy and paste it and clean it up a little bit, uh, you will notice that you know it created this plot, but then it forgot, ChatGPT forgot to add this particular line here. 
So it's just this. So this thing that I just highlighted here, add tiles, that's all we forgot. So it added the latitudes and longitudes correctly. Uh, it added the markers similar to what Copilot gave to me. It just forgot to, uh, you know, surround the map with the, with the, fill out the map. If I just add that, add tiles, I would see that ChatGPT did a much better job. So it placed LSE exactly where LSE is. So it placed us correctly. So that means that these coordinates, however, no one understands how these tools actually work, uh, by the way. So even the creators of ChatGPT, they don't fully understand how ChatGPT is so good. But for some reason, it found that these are the latitudes and longitudes coordinates for LSE. Uh, and it works. And the map is there. And it works as I want to. So what do what can we learn from interacting with this tool uh, straight away? Um, my takeaway from this, and this is just one illustration of how you would incorporate that in teaching, is that these AI tools, they can help you kickstart the coding process. So if a student learns how to use, how to write the right prompts to, to interact with these tools, um, they get rid of that fear of the blank page. And like, I need to create this leaflet map and I don't even remember, I don't know where to go to. Um, so this can give you a boilerplate. It can give you a template for what you do. Um, but students will still need to understand the code they're writing. If they simply copy and paste the code, they will not get the response uh, they wanted. But it is, it is key here that our, uh, our assignments as instructors are um, conducive to this process. If we give just fill in the blanks kind of assignments, so like this is a code, uh, add, figure out what is missing and add something here. So that will not be as stimulating and you will not be gaining much from this process of using the AI tools. But if you give a more open-ended questions like I did, like I want a leaflet map centered at the LSC, um, then you get to experience this process of the trial and error, but it's a guided trial and error. And you, along the way, you also teach students how to interact with these tools, how to write more efficient uh, questions. And when the AI gets the code wrong, you teach students where to go to for information. So that's here where we go to the traditional approach of go and check the documentation of that particular package you're looking for, understand a little bit how it works. So it it, it perhaps even I would say that it gives a, a little bit of a curiosity in there. Like I can almost see the thing working, right? When we had the, especially with the co-pilot example, it's kind of working, but not really right. So then it, it's it's one minute where like, it's just one uh, thought away uh, for you to understand that, okay, the, what, the thing that I got wrong was just the coordinates, that's fine. Uh, and then I would say that this helps me understand this code a bit better. So I know where to add, adjust and change. So uh, we still need to understand the code we're writing. And I would say that this serves as a teaching opportunity to explain why these tools sometimes fail. So why doesn't ChatGPT uh, give me the right solution? What, why did it forget? Um, and this is where, as a structure, you would say, well, we don't, uh, this ChatGPT was not created for providing the right solution, the correct solution. It was created to give you the statistically um, convincing sound solution, um, convincingly sound solution. So you, you, there's, there's a bit of, you know, a teaching here and there about the tools themselves. And as I would say towards the end here, I think this is an important skill because we're seeing these tools um, gaining popularity and um, being part of many professions now, and perhaps it will be embedded in many of the tools we use every day, like Google and Microsoft tools. So maybe that's a good way of going and approaching the tools, like let's incorporate that. Um, and also one thing that is important for, for the things I teach is that AI won't always write clean code. Uh, we need to teach that. Like clean code involves writing code that I can understand in a year's time or that others can read, understand, and replicate and run alone. AI would not be that good for that. Even Copilot. Like it will, sometimes it would just cop, 
duplicate, duplicate, duplicate things. So you might not as always get the best response. So there's a lot of learning opportunities. And I think this helps us focus on the right things rather than focusing on syntax, rather than focusing on, oh, you forgot, um, you know, curly break brackets here. That's not the main important thing we're learning when we're coding. We're, we're, we want to achieve some things. And I can share that our students, I had some informal conversations with students in the last academic term, and they really enjoyed the productivity boost that these tools gave them. Some preferred ChatGPT, some preferred a Copilot. Interestingly, you always have a group of students that prefer not to use any of these AI tools, and that's also okay. Uh, I don't think we should force people to use AI tools. I just think that we should you know, give that as another set of tools. So if you want, you can use that, but that is not that is not for everyone. That is not the way everyone learns, but we should embrace it. Okay, so that's how we do we code. And as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, students, they learn that in the teaching uh, when we're teaching, but they also can use it for their assignments and that's not considered cheating. What that um, implies is that our assignments have to be to a standard where we judge originality and creativity a lot more than we judge you know, it, ha it, it can't be formulaic, fill in the blanks. That's something that I would argue is not good for learning anyways. But what about then essay writing, right? As I said, that's what people fear the most. So if you're writing an essay with ChatGPT and then, you know, ChatGPT will confabulate things, will come up with random facts that are not true. So what happens then? Like, should we not just simply abolish that, like and ab abandon ChatGPT for this practice. Well, um, first we, we have to think about how well ChatGPT can write an essay. Uh, many people will fear that students will write their AI to use this AI tools to write their essays, and you know they will not learn anything from it, and that that will be the end of the learning experience. I think that's misguided. Uh, but if you play with ChatGPT, you will know that it can write a pretty convincing essay, it can give you, you know, if you give it a prompt and send it to ChatGPT, it give you some, um, some essay. Um, but I would say that most often than not, they are very boring and unoriginal. So the essays are like convincing, they are okay. But remember, these tools, they are trained, they were created to generate um, likely uh, you know, the, the most likely set of words uh, that you would encounter. So this is kind of like getting all the essays that has ever been written in higher education and taking the average of that and writing it. So like, that would not be super original. That would be very boring. Like, and you, you try it yourself and try to write it yourself if you've done it. You see that the writing is good. Sometimes it sounds, some people describe it as uh, white male um speak like uh, it's just like someone super convincing and authoritative that's kind of how ChatGPT sounds sometimes but the in terms of content it's rather boring uh, I'll say so to avoid this again we have to rethink our marking criteria we haven't really aced that we still don't have the best solution for that um, but we're moving towards something that I think is a great goal uh, towards like originality and critical thinking, very similar to the goals that we had for, uh, for coding. Um, and because the essays will be kind of boring and unoriginal and formulaic, that's why I would say that as instructors, we have nothing to fear about that. So if a student is getting straight A's, with just using ChatGPT in your essays, it just means that your essay prompt is just not original as well. So like your essay prompt is just too boring. <laughs> we have to, to, to improve that. And I don't think that is a problem with AI tools themselves. Like it's a problem of how we think about these assignments. Um, the key thing here is what are we asking our students to write about? Um, the way we've done, and if you remember the, the three courses that I showed you at the beginning, DS101 is the course where it's more essay based. And in those course, in, in that course, we asked students in the beginning, like they have to judge a particular academic paper and reflect on that. And we have like specific criteria about, they, they should link 
to things they we show them in the classroom. Um, this is perhaps the most important thing. So that way they show that even if they're using ChatGPT or whatever, they're still linking to things that we expressly uh, taught. Um, and that would be part of, more unique in that way. But also um, they're asked to think more broadly and think, okay, so if this academic paper is about an application of, uh, uh, of AI, of an application of a new technology um, that is disrupting some, some markets and some labor forces, what would be the future? Like think about other stuff uh, outside of the context of the limited context of the academic article. Um, but in the final essay for those students, we asked them to write about something, about an application of data science and AI for their own degree program. So if you are doing anthropology, if you're doing sociology, you will try to find an application, or if there's any, there isn't any, you, you try to see how anthropologists, sociologists could use these tools in the future, or how would that reshape the way you, people conduct research. Uh, so that will nudge people towards thinking more original thoughts. And rather than just saying, write an essay about supervised learning, which is something like very specific and you know, it would be boring. So we can't have boring essay prompts as well. Um, this is how we instruct our students. So we also tell them, in, you know, if you use AI help, it's okay. It, and I tell students, even if they just simply copy and pasted the essay prompt and put it on ChatGPT, and ChatGPT gave um, an essay that they think is okay and good for submission, they can submit that. If that's all it takes, that tells me that my essay prompts are not good. So for the next iteration, I'm gonna change that. And all I ask for them is that to report. They have to report what they're doing. And I also explain that, you know, they tend to generate responses that sound convincing, but are not necessarily correct. So, and then we ask our students, think about it. How are you checking whether the, the things you're getting out of ChatGPT or any other tool is correct? How do you fact check things? And that brings us back to scholarly practice, right? So uh, journalists, they have that embedded in the practices, for example, they know how to fact check, they learn, that's what they learn how to do. Academics, we also have to learn how to check the sources, check the references, see who is saying what and where they come from. We have to think more critically about things. And I think that's what higher education should be about. And that exchange, right? That's what is unique about that. Even either online, either in person, that is the thing that I think universities can give society the most, um, the best. And yeah, so if their responses the, the essay will be judged as if it was a person, fine, uh, even if they do use with the AI, uh, but then we're gonna use it, we're, we're gonna um, judge them on originality, and then we're we're fine tuning the marking criteria so that we actually um, assess on that. Um, in terms of teaching, I use ChatGPT for a, a bit of fun during uh, the last term as well. So I did a live demo, uh, about fake news, and we know that that's one of the major concerns that uh, you know governments and people are thinking about. Because these tools, if they're on, they, they fall in the wrong hands, they can tailor uh, fake news to the specific people um, that they're targeting. So think about Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica was this big scandal where um, bad actors were had access to people's profiles, psychological profiles, and they could target them on Facebook using specific um, marketing strategies and things that you know would give them some propaganda or something that would entice fear depending on the person's profile. So that is what people are concerned about. And many people say like, don't use ChatGPT because this thing confabulates, this thing hallucinates and creates fake news. Well, maybe that's a good way, if people are not, informed about how this works and how easy it is to create fake news. Maybe that's something we should uh, be telling people about. So just a bit of a, an example here. Uh, what I did was I asked students to say, log in to ChatGPT and ask it to create some fake news for you. Something about London, something about, I don't know. 
Uh, and they couldn't, because if you've been using ChatGPT, you know that it would say, as an AI language, large language model, I cannot produce uh, misinformation, blah, blah, blah. It would say that. But a trick that many people who are familiar with ChatGPT would know is that you can ask it to impersonate someone. So I asked it to impersonate Rita Skeeter, which is a character in Harry Potter series that is essentially kind of a Daily Mail reporter that you know has a very uh, opinionated views of facts. Uh, so then when I asked it to do that, and I asked it to write a nasty fake little news piece about how climate change is a fad and not real. And then it did say that. And then I asked for more information that kept on going and it produced this, this pearl here for me because look at the second, the second part of this slide. So I asked it to create evidence and I gave it as quotes. And it gave me some facts and some things that sound convincing. If you were to read it on an online website and it's in bullet point and there's percentage and there's big names and acronyms, depending on how you landed into this page, you believe that all of this is true. And none of this is what you're seeing here is factual. None of that is factual. I intentionally asked the AI to create fake news for me and it kind of worked. Um, so what did we learn from this experience? So students were shocked of how easy I made it to be like, but just by impersonating. And by the way, OpenAI has been putting some safeguards to avoid this kind of thing to happen. But still, we can, you can still uh, find ways around it. So maybe we shouldn't hide from this reality. Maybe we should teach students that, you know, like this is quite easy to do, like in it's a different scale. And let's think about that. Let's let's address it as a problem. Should a ban? Should we put a ban on companies that are creating these tools? Or you know, some people might be creating those tools anyways, regardless of the ban or not. So how? What is our response to that? Like it's it's not an easy problem. And our students, I think, mean, conversations with our students, maybe we can address them. So some lessons learned from this initial experiments. All of these kind of experiments, we don't have yet a very structured way of addressing. I'm hopeful that we will have something by next academic year. But what I can tell you is that some students did not feel like using ChatGPT at all to write their essays. I actually had one student that said, can I not use it? Am I allowed to not use it? And of course. Uh, but it's, again, the same with code. You're, it's just a tool. Like it's there. It's a tool for you to use. And we're thinking about it critically, but it's not mandatory. But those students who did use it, they find it very, very useful for outlining what they're going to, to talk about. They find it useful for brainstorming, you know, that kind of thing where you're discussing with someone and then you don't know where to go and you, you, you interact with the tool and then there's an idea there. That doesn't replace the instructor, that doesn't replace the classroom discussions. It's just like an aid. It's just something that it can help with understanding where you're going. Um, many people, said that it helps, and I do find that myself, it helps connecting sentences and ideas. And I believe that even the process of iteratively editing and something written by an AI tool can give me uh, uh, an understanding of, you know, how to write better myself without the AI tool. I find that by myself, my personal um, opinion is that, yeah, I can, I feel like I can write a bit better now because I have this kind of uh, tool. So final thoughts, how should we use AI in higher education or should we use AI in higher education? My current answer is yes, uh, I think we should embrace it. I would actually say it's an imperative to engage somehow with generative AI. And I posted here like this, this photo I took out of Temple Station here in London where there's this ad for a particular AI tool that can help uh, you know, solicitors, lawyers to find cases uh, and judgments. And if you check the news, you know that some guy, some person in Texas used something similar to that. They actually used ChatGPT to help them build a case for an argument he was making in court. And he didn't know that ChatGPT fabricated information and he used them. And now he's having to respond to, you know, I use arguments based on things that do not exist. So maybe we should be teaching students how to you know, use the tools, but be careful. Uh, and how should instructors do that? I would say experiment. So the first thing you can do is experiment. I don't yet have a full clear path for you, but 
I would say that the best thing I can do myself right now is experiment. Again, as evident as is evident on this ad, we see these tools um, dominating much of our careers and markets and stuff. So let's experiment with that. Even if you have a critical eye, give it a go and see how it works and how it doesn't work. Uh, I would say also experiment with text to image generators. You've probably seen this photo uh, of the Pope with puffer jackets uh, that was generated by a text to image. He's not that cool yet. Um, and also try using try using these tools. Like really uh, try to explore the different. Try creating uh, something. I like to do is coming up with the weirdest prompt of all. Uh, something that is inconceivable. You wouldn't see happening. And then you 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 paste it there, you get an image, and then you're like, hmm, how did it assemble all of that? And what are the hidden biases in there? So why is this image generated particularly the way it is, even though I created something that is weird and nonsensical? Um, there is a lot to learn from this. There's a lot to learn from the knowledge of the web, of the internet. Uh, so I'd say my my main takeaway here is like, give it a go and see uh, and criticize it, but give it a go. Thank you all very much. So I'll hand it back to Geoffrey and I'll hear from you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Fantastic. Uh, oh, I found it really interesting myself. We've got a couple of questions and I'm going to sure. read them out to you. Um, the first one is from Wallace. They've asked, how do students cite information for their essay that comes from G chat GPT? Right. So um, it's not a good practice to cite chat GPT as, uh, as an information uh, you know, repository. So what we ask students is to disclose that they've used it. But if they, let's say, in the references, they put reference to chat GPT, they would be penalized for that because that is not a reliable source of reference. So it's a tool, but it's not a tool for finding the reference. There are tools that are helpful in that. So you can use Bing AI, for example, and Bing AI will sometimes give you, uh, and there's something called, um, I think it's elicit, elicit.org, that is for academic references, and it uses the same technology, ChatGPT, but then you can write questions, and then you give you academic references. So you would have to check whether those academic references exist, and then you cite those references. But you wouldn't cite ChatGPT as a source. You, what we ask them is to simply disclose that they've used it, uh, not as a source, not, not use it as a reference source. Great. Uh, question from Dr. Lola Peach. They said, I agree that encouraging students to think more critically and add references can go some way to manage plagiarism. But can you say something more about AI and copyright breaching? Right. Yeah, that's a big issue. I actually don't know how to solve it. And honestly, I also don't know how I feel about it. Because uh, one of the major criticisms that I would have um, about OpenAI, for example, is that you know we're using ChatGPT. We're using GPT. They gave us some idea of how they created GPT 3.5, which is the one that most people are using. But we have no idea what GPT 4, the one that you have to pay for, was trained. Absolutely no idea. We don't know which data sets they used, nothing. Um, and you're right in saying that maybe some of the content that um, OpenAI used is, you know, they shouldn't be scraping it. They shouldn't they wouldn't be allowed to scrape that, that information. Um, but as I said, I don't know. I don't, I don't honestly have a good answer to that. I would say that I could even take the approach, the more moral approach and say, well, if they don't disclose it, I won't use it. And I think that's, that's adequate. Some people are, have that approach. But I would say that as with many technologies, say Google, Google also uh, crawls the web for many things, and they probably shouldn't have access. Like it was a legal battle to get Google to allow someone to ask for removal, right? Now you can go and request that Google delete some pages about you or some things that you think is wrong and misrepresenting um, you, but it took some time. Regulation is always slow to catch up with this kind of technologies. But 
what I'm saying is, if I feel weird about the copywriting issues of ChatGPT and, you know, it's weird, it's in there, maybe I should also feel weird about search engines because they also uh, crawl the web. Uh, so I guess my, uh, my answer is a non-answer because I, I don't know exactly how I feel about that. But there's a, a danger, like there's a, there's a real danger here that depending on how you query, ChatGPT will generate code or will generate uh, text that is um, private and that shouldn't be used as a reference. Uh, that is one of the reasons why some companies don't allow their employees to use GitHub Copilot because they don't have clarity on whether Microsoft has used only good licenses on when training those algorithms. So I think that's a good discussion to have. Uh, but I also don't think that it bars us from testing and experimenting with these tools just yet, because frankly, we're kind of powerless against that. Like we can we can pressure, we can put pressure. Um, but yeah, I would say that I'm ambivalent about all of this. Thanks. Um, another question. Um, did those students that chose not to use chat cheap GPT perform better or worse than those did? And how do you assess those that do or don't use it? Right. So that is why I was saying that it's all experimental at this stage. We don't have the great guidelines. What I can tell is that um, we're just finishing uh, the marking process of the final essays on this uh, uh, on this course the one where we allowed more explicitly to use the chat GPT. There were two essays. In the first round, not, not a lot of students picked up on chat GPT. The ones who did, we noticed that some of their writing was, the sentences were better connected than those, some of those students who did not. But I would say it wasn't anything like super amazing, uh, honestly. As I was saying, like sometimes it generates boring, repetitive and commonplace stuff. Um, but I haven't yet read the final essays that our students wrote. Uh, but I can say anecdotally that there is one student that said that, you know, she said like I was proofreading it all the time and she felt herself that her writing was better. So the way she was expressing herself compared to herself was better when she was using the AI tool. Um, but yeah, we still don't have clear guidelines from, you know, how um, we were, we're gonna judge the text Right, we're not gonna assess them based on whether they use or not ChatGPT. We're gonna judge them on originality, creativity, and how they connected the ideas. If they were able to do that themselves without ChatGPT, that's also great. But we need we need clearer guidance on that. Yeah. Uh, question from Jin Shui. Um, they've asked, how do you guarantee the equality in mm. the classroom if you're rich and can afford chat gpt plus you can get so that you can get access to even better gpt4 model while others don't um students that are good at writing prompts may get not only better writing paraphrasing but also ideas or inspirations thus get higher score uh, mm -hmm. will you officially make prompt engineering a more formal module just like courses about Python or mm -hmm. R programming. That's very good. Thank you, Jin Shui. Uh, I'll say that the, the question about whether you can afford a better um, AI tool or not. Um, frankly, myself, I don't find GPT-4 that much better than GPT-3, so I, I wouldn't worry so much about that. But one aside here is that Perhaps all of these tools we're talking about today, if we do the same talk next year, they'll probably be outdated. There'll probably be other tools. I think these tools will become embedded in things we use, like Microsoft Word uh, and, and all of that. Um, things like Grammarly has been there for, for quite some time. So how do we guarantee equality? So I think that one of the best ways is teaching prompt engineering for writing in the classroom, because you can get good, very good, uh, you know, recommendations and ideas and things from the free uh, and perhaps even the open source solutions that will come out in the next months. So I'd say 
teaching, that's why I think like we should incorporate teaching of prompt engineering, how to get what we want from tools. Uh, that I, I believe, and that is a belief, right? I believe that this will um, uh, flatten out the, 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 the skills, but we have to teach that. We have to encourage the students. And that's the same, and addressing the same question, the second question about, uh, you know, should we make prompt engineering a formal module or something that we should be teaching? I don't think just yet, but I think it's definitely something I would show and I would demonstrate during the course. And if we show them, you know, this is how you get Copilot to give you a leaflet map, uh, that solves some of the imbalance that we have. So then all students, they are aware of all the practices. And if they're using a more advanced tool, uh, a paid version, I wouldn't worry so much because I don't think they're that much greater than, than the free versions that are out there. That's great. And that, that brings the end of um, all the questions. Uh, thank you for, for hosting today, Jonathan, um, for a fascinating talk, which I hope everyone enjoyed. And, and thank you for the audience for joining and asking questions. There are a lot more exciting events coming up this week at the festival. So do check out the program at lsc.ac.uk forward slash festival. The next LSC online skills session will be the same time tomorrow where Dr. Karen King and Dr. Orly Nielsen will explore how to negotiate the essentials you need to know to manage people and change in business today. You can find out more about our LSE online courses via the link on the slide and in the chat box. And uh, thank you everyone, see you all soon. Thank you all.